Hey you guys, it's Rachel here with Senza Tempo Cani Corso. Oh, no, 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 no. <clears throat> Give me that. <clears throat> yep, just like his mammy. So I'm here today with Berlin and our um, preacher son, who I have yet to name. And, um, and so I wanted to talk to you guys about Cherry Eye. Because Berlin has cherry eye, which is the red thing poking out of his eye. And so what it is, is it is the nictitating membrane, um, also known as the third eyelid. Really, Berlin? Psh, hey, chill out. You can get a good look at it there. Um, and so it's it's relatively harmless. It, uh, not harmless, but painless, I should say. Psh, ah, no, no, no humping. Savannah, get on to him. No. Yeah, no humping. No. So, um, what it does is um, basically helps protect the eye, and it also provides some moisture to the eye. Although it's not the only, um, it's not the only source of moisture to the eye. Now, um. So, uh, so anyway, so where does it come from? Well, all breeds are, are, um, any, any breed of dog can get it or a mixed breed dog can get it, but there are some breeds that are, um, more prone to it than others. So there's definitely a genetic component. Um, now in that regard, like, you know, um, for example, so, so there are some things if you breed them, things get worse, right? So like if you keep breeding dogs with bad hips, then you'll end up with just, you know, loads of really bad hips in your program. Um, cherry eye really just isn't like that. Um, I will say that some lines are more prone to it than others, but mm, I've never seen a high incidence of it. Like, so for example, Batista had cherry eye in one eye and then, um, and the only puppy that I've ever seen out of him to have cherry eye, I think was a litter mate to, um, to Hefe, I believe. Um, so one puppy out of that litter and then Nirvana had cherry eye, um, one eye and, um, and now he has it. So one puppy. So from what I've seen, um, it's not, it's not very, um, prevalent. And those are the only dogs that I've had with it. Um, Preacher has, like, sometimes his will get a little irritated, but it, it's never actually fully prolapsed or anything. Like, we've we've seen it on camera before. It's like, it's it's it just kind of gets a little irritated, but it's not red like that. It's white, and it never comes all the way out like that. And I think out of all of Preacher's litters, we might have had maybe two puppies get it. So, you know, it happens. It can happen. Um, like I said, there's, there's, you know, various ideas of where it comes from. You know, a lot of people believe that, that, ah, 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 no, a lot of people believe that it's genetic. Um, some people believe, and I have kind of found this, um, to possibly to be true is that, um, so like Vicky over at Cape Fear, um, she says that she's seen a lot of puppies get it after vaccinations. So as like a, um, almost like as an immune response. So regardless of where it comes from, um, the reality is that it can happen. It's not really considered a big deal. In fact, it's so common in our breed and many other breeds that, that of the breeds that are um, predisposed to it, nobody covers it in their contracts. Nobody's going to pay to fix the cherry eye. It's um, cosmetic, first of all. Um, doesn't really, even if you didn't get it fixed, which you should, but even if you didn't, it wouldn't shorten the dog's lifespan or anything like that. Um, but you should get it fixed. Now, as far as fixing it is concerned, um, historically people always removed them and that's what I've always done. I've removed them. Now, when you go to the vet, they're going to try to talk you into doing what's called tacking it. Tacking it is where they basically just stuff it back in there and um, and then try to reattach it and hope it stays in there. And it's very expensive to do. And it's, um, it is very, 
what is the word? An uns it's, it's typically a very unsuccessful surgery, meaning that dogs that get it will often get it again. And tacking it is really not a viable solution for most dogs. Now, what it will do is it will cost you a fortune because um, tacking it is, is typically more expensive. Now, um, previously treating or, or removing cherry eye was a very cheap endeavor. I think for... Um, for Batista, I think I spent $190 on his. And I think um, with Nirvana, prices had gone up. I went to a different vet. I think I spent maybe $225 on hers. Um, but that's after the vet that originally charged me $190 for Batista. I went to the same vet. They tried to charge me $600 a year later. So I was like, okay, what's going on? Why is it so much more expensive? They told me that it was the prices of the medication that had gone up. But then I was able to drive, you know, 30, 45 minutes to a smaller town and get the surgery done for the, um, for the 225. So I don't, I don't believe that. I think that because the first vet was in the city and um, in Austin and people have a lot of money in Austin, most of the time they knew that they could charge more. So they were charging more. That's just literally what it was. It's very, very, very simple. All they do is they just cut it out. They just remove it. It's attached. Um, they remove it. And I know that because whenever Batista's was done, um, he got his cone off because he's the master of getting his cone off. And he um, kind of just rubbed the ear a little bit and um, or the eye a little bit and basically it undid the stitches. And so um, and so anyway, so he has this he has this little hole there in that tissue, just this tiny little hole where they had cut it. And then they they do watch him, watch him, watch him. They do like two stitches. He need, yeah, he needs to go potty. Um, they do two stitches um, to sh kind of close it. And um, and so anyway, his. Um, his head open, but it was, even with it being open, it didn't require being closed. Like it was such a benign thing that it, it literally did nothing. Um, so anyway, so it's, like I said, it's, it's extremely, extremely simple. The most complicated thing about it is putting your dog under anesthesia in the first place. Um, and for me, th this is, this is my big thing is, um, they'll, they'll, they'll really, one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of vets is that they will push things on you that really are not in the dog's best interest or yours just because they think that it's ethically right. So for example, most vets think it's ethically wrong to remove the cherry eye, even though um, they're tacking it as often unsuccessful and removal of the cherry eye very rarely ever results in dryness of the eye, which is what they claim. They're like, oh, it'll, it'll, it'll present with dry eye. Well, all I can tell you is, is that I have not met a person yet that's had dry eye in their dog because they removed cherry eye. I've seen people with dogs with dry eye, but not because they removed cherry eye. It was a breed thing. It was Boston Terriers. Come here, Berlin, get out of that now. Quit, quit trying to look for Scooby snacks. So, um, so anyway, so having said that, um, no, you're not sleeping down here. No, ma'am. I'm not sleeping. Yeah, you are. You're trying to sleep down here. No. Go bring me some firewood. My, my fire's almost out. Uh, yep, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so like I said, it's, this is, this is the thing for me is if we know that it has a high fail rate as far as the, the, um, the tacking surgery and we know that most dogs do not suffer from dry eye and even if they do they simply just need drops then why would we cuz this is the other risk okay this these are the risks of removal the only risk is a when you put the dog under anesthesia the dog may react poorly and may and may die um that happens under anesthesia b um if you remove the cherry eye there's a small chance from what I've seen, that your dog may um, may have dry eye. Um, even if that's the case, there's drops for that, so you would be okay. Now, the risk to the tacking is that it won't work, and so you'll be stuck paying an additional um, whatever it was that you paid. I think the cheapest that I've seen for tacking is like 800 bucks. 
So you're going to spend an additional um, procedure. You don't get a discount. You don't, there's nothing like that. It's just like you did it the first time. Your dog has to be um, anesthetized again. Um, and so, um, so you're gonna have to pay for that. And there's a bunch of risks, like I said, involved in that. Every time you put a dog under, there's a high risk that they won't come back. Not, I won't say a high risk, but there is a risk, um, that they could respond. Even if they've done well before, every time you put your dog under anesthesia, there's always risk. So, um, so anyway, so risk of the surgery um, and then, um, like I said, they're, they're, uh, the risk of the, the cost. And then it's still not a guarantee. Even if you do the tacking you, again, a second time, um, I want to say after, I don't know, I guess it depends on the vet, but I would hope that if you had done it twice and it was unsuccessful, that the vet would go ahead and just do the removal. But, um, but anyway, but it's just for me, the way that I see it. In my experience, it's just an, an extra way to get more money out of you. And so I, I'm just not a fan um, at all. And um, I think that it's uh, counterproductive to do the tacking. And I hope, I really hope to God that they never make it illegal, which I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to do that because it just seems like veterinary um, practices are just completely out of out of whack right now and they're it's it's like somebody went to the drawing board and it's like what can we do to get the most amount of money out of people possible you know and so any type of procedure anything that could be done to um to lessen the dog's chances of having like another encounter with the vet is they're going to be against it. Like, for example, a lot of vets are against ear cropping, even though there are medical, in fact, you, you, you know, they're against ear cropping and yet ear cropping is a method that they handle um, issues with dog's ears. So for example, if you have a, a dog that has hematoma of the ear and it won't heal, then they will amputate that ear, AKA crop the ear. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, uh, it's a weird deal, but they, but they wouldn't ever let you do it beforehand. Like what, what, like what we do with our dogs, you know what I mean? Um, so, um, so anyway, so, and then, and then another thing, you know, like a lot of vets are still pushing early spay and neuter. Ah, ah, ah. No, no, we will not eat that. No. Um, so a lot of vets are, are, are still pushing early spay and neuter um, which is outdated and dangerous and unhealthy for your dog and will cause you to spend a fortune in vet bills in the long run. Um, and, uh, what's another one? Oh, uh, over vaccination. Um, over vaccination is a problem. I can't tell you how many times that I'll send a puppy home and I'll provide the stickers. Lately, I've not only been providing the stickers, I just send the whole vial, like literally like the vial that the, that the vaccine comes in. I literally send that. The whole thing with the buyer and the vet still threw a tantrum and are like, was it given by a vet? Obviously not if you have it in your hand. Um, but nonetheless, you know, they, they would much rather just give your dog more vaccinations. Um, you know, just because, you know, hey, you know, it, it, it's it's they can't prove that it was done. So, you know, whatever. Um, what are you what are you what are you chewing on? Like, literally, what do you have? Why are you trying to? cause me emotional issues by chewing on things you shouldn't be move um so uh what was the other thing oh uh okay heartworm uh, heartworm takes six to seven months to mature to mature to the point that they can actually get into the heart of your dog okay so in reality let's say that you wanted to be super safe in reality if you tested your dog every five months for heartworm, if the dog was negative, you wouldn't need to do anything. If the dog was positive, all you would need to do is give one heartworm pill. If you wanted to even be, you know, even more careful, you could give two, um, one month and then the next month give the next one. And that would be enough to kill the worms before they ever actually infested the heart, okay? And, um, and that works and the reason why the reason why it can be dangerous to give a heartworm pill to a dog that's already has heartworm is because if the infestation has um, matured and it's in the heart, whenever you kill them, whenever they die, they can um, un, uh, they can 
clog up the arteries. So that's why you have to be really careful about it. But if you take care of it before they ever get to that stage, then it's not a problem. So, um, and same thing with fleas. I mean, there's, there's things that dogs can get from fleas, but you know, most of it's like tapeworm, um, the, the, you know, the, for, for a dog to get anemic from fleas, it would be so bad that like, if it was an inside dog, you, you wouldn't be able to live with that dog. It would, it would be very, very, very bad. So basically what vets do is they, um, make a big deal out of things that, that really are not as big of a deal, or let's say that it's not as big of a deal, but like they won't give you a better way of handling it. So for example, you and I both know that um, if they came out with a topical pair, you know, a topical where you would never get bitten by a bug, like a, like a mosquito, and you just stick this topical pesticide on your children once a month, nobody's going to do that. You know what I mean? Now, you will treat um, yourself if you're going out with something, you'll spray yourself, but you're not just going to preemptively, you know, put a pesticide on your body um, every single month. But they expect you to do that with your dogs over things that really are no different than us. Like we can also get infections from mosquitoes, um, you know, life-threatening um, infections from mosquitoes. Uh, so, you know, it. I think that they should be treating infection. So, for example, if you took your dog in um, the way that I was talking about with heartworm, you wouldn't be giving your dog monthly chemicals. You would be treating infection if you found it, right? And to me, that is that is the correct way to go about it. But they've tricked people into um, into doing this because it makes them a lot of money. It doesn't matter that dogs are really sick. It doesn't matter that you know flea and tick medications are 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 highly correlated um, with health issues, particularly neurological issues. Um, they don't care about any of that. And it's interesting to me how a vet will tell me, don't remove the cherry eye because the dog could get dry eye, which would only result in drops. And yet he will promote heartworm and flea and tick, which is literally has far more potential side effects than removing a cherry eye does. It, it doesn't make any sense unless you're looking at it from the standpoint of these people are pushing pharmaceuticals because that's what they've been paid to do. Um, and that's what they, and they probably get kickbacks. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I'm sure somebody could tell me. But there is a, there is an incentive for them to push this kind of stuff instead of pushing what is healthier for your animals. Like there's absolutely no reason to give your dog heartworm medication in the wintertime if you live somewhere where there are no mosquitoes but yet your vet will still push it. Why? Because there's, you know, financial incentives. Maybe they're making money off of the product. Um, you know, maybe they buy the heartworm medication, they have it in stock, and then you buy it from them. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I can guarantee you that, um, that the reasoning is not innocent because they know this information just like we know this information. Another thing I like to do is they like to take things that are really benign and things that you would normally like know about, but then label it something entirely different so that it scares you. So for example, dogs can also have Audi belly buttons, right? People can have Audi belly buttons. And there are some lines of, um, of like family lines that are more prone to Audi belly buttons than others. But You'll never hear anybody talk about how you shouldn't have children if you have an Audi belly button. It's really not a big deal. It's not typically correlated with anything else. Um, and yet vets will act like a Audi belly button on a dog is this really big thing. And they've renamed it. Although I will say they're not renamed it. With humans, we call it an Audi, uh, an, an, an Audi belly button. But it, the reality of the situation is it is called an umbilical hernia. But the vet will tell you like it's some genetic defect. I had a vet recently try to do that with a customer, try to act like it's some genetic defect. Like, like, the, like I needed to know so that I wasn't breeding dogs with genetic defects, which is so ridiculous because umbilical hernias don't do anything. They're not, they're not, they're not correlated with anything. Um, a lot of breeders will act like, because breeders just love to, um, use anything to try to ruin each other's reputations. Um, which is why like we've, breeders are are really I'm just going to be honest victimized by like exactly what I'm going through in my area 
Um, they, they're just, we, we don't know how to work together. You know what I mean? We don't know how, like whenever the Uber came and the, and the taxi drivers were all working together and stuff like that. We, we, we will help tear each other down before we'll work together. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But nonetheless, um, umbilical hernias are very common. Um, and they're, they're not a big deal. And it's not the same thing as other hernias that can be related to, um, midline defects, which are very different and they're very large and they cause like the intestine to be outside of the body or poking out. And it's a very different thing. Okay. Very different thing. And so, and people often confuse them, uh, which actually unfortunately happens a lot in the dog world. So, um, so anyway, so long story short, <laughs> um, you know, all I can tell you is, is that if you have a dog with cherry eye, just, just try to find somebody that'll, that'll remove it for you. Um, the best thing to do is to go out in the country where people don't have a lot of money, where vets are not exploiting people that have more money so that you can get it done at a reasonable price. I have, I've had people call me that live in the, um, live in like, uh, I would say if you live within an hour or two of, um, Burnett, Texas and you're, and you're being, you know, overcharged, let me know and I can refer you to the vet that I used to go to. I already had a guy who um, was going through this in San Antonio. They wanted to charge him like $1,100 or something like that. And he got it done for under 300 bucks um, at my vet. And he was just thanking me so much. So it's really unfortunate. These vets are absolutely taking advantage. Um, and I and I really, I'm, I'm going to do a video about it. Um, but I need to get, I want it to be a higher kind of production thing like that way it gets more traction because I feel that it's so important that um that we need to really wake up and start paying attention before before it gets to the point where um where it was back in the old days where only rich people have dogs you know what I mean because there's a there that's there's um a reality to that there was a time when poor people were not even allowed to have purebred dogs so, um, so anyway, so things are, things are being, things are getting real weird around dogs and, um, somebody has got to say something real quick or things are going to get worse. And this is just a symptom of it. You know what I mean? Not being able to get basic veterinary care, um, is a symptom of it. And so, so a little story about cherry eye becomes a bigger, a bigger thing because that's kind of what's on my mind right now. And that's kind of what I'm dealing with. And I guess I just want to make it obvious that um, because like as a, as a breeder to say to people, hey, you know, don't trust your vet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the guy that went to school for however long, nine years, I think it is. And, you know, this and that. Right. Like, but I'm telling you, um, it's a problem. It is a problem. And there is there's one vet that actually was honest about it. And um, he wrote, she or he, I'm not sure, wrote, wrote an article about it, um, about why they were quitting and exactly what I'm talking about. That it's, that it's, um, it's exploitative. I hope that's the right word. Um, and so, um, and there was also, there's a market watch. If you, if you, if you, it was in Canada, but if you Google market watch, veterinary ex ex exposing veterinary expenses or something like that there's um there was a whole video on it in canada where they were able to track how many vaccinations they used to give and now what they're giving now and all the prices and blah 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 and so the prices were going up way before any kind of uh what's going on now this has been happening for a long long time and um only now it's just it's just it's gotten really, really bad. And I, and I know what's happening, but I don't know particularly why I have some ideas. I have some theories based upon, um, big corporations that have bought out veterinary office, things like that. So I have some ideas of what's going on, but I'm not a hundred percent on it yet, which is why I haven't made the video. Um, and in fact, I'm really hoping to be able to interview some vets and stuff like that to kind of get, um, a good perspective. So, um, anyway, long winded, but, um, but necessary for this, for this particularly, for this particular subject. So, um, the last thing I will end with is, cause I know I'm going to hear it. 
why would you be breeding a dog with cherry eye? If you're trying to breed the best dogs, why would you be breeding a dog with a fault? And the reason for that is because if we were to remove every single dog that had cherry eye, we would have very little genetic diversity. And this is the problem is very few animals have as many health problems as we people do. Dogs are one of them. And the reason is because dogs are um, very, mm, what's the word? Um, like they have very little genetic diversity in comparison to other animals that we breed. So horses, for example, you can breed two registered horses together of different registries, different breeds, but you can still register them in each one. So it allows for greater genetic diversity. And um, a lot of other animals, chickens and cows and all that kind of stuff, um, a lot of them allow mixing and stuff. It's, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal, but with dogs... Um, we we want them to be this this pureness, right? And the reality is that as pre breeds popularity increases and wanes, they get they go through bottlenecks, genetic bottlenecks. And our breed went through one not very long ago. In fact, they've only recently kind of come out of recovery. And so there's not a lot of genetic diversity. And if you were to remove dogs for, I mean, everything. So you remove them for bad hips, which, you know, we should. Remove them for bad elbows, obviously, which we should. Remove them for structural faults, temperament faults. The, every time you add a new fault to the list and you remove those dogs, you're making the gene pool smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so eventually you have to get to the point where you have to realize that some things are not worth removing a dog over. And if the veterinary prices were not as high as they were, it really wouldn't be considered a big deal. Like, for example, if you get a female dog and you need to spay her, that's a lot more invasive than, say, removing a cherry eye. You know what I mean? So, um, so anyway, so, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things where for us, it's purely cosmetic it's, it's really not a big deal. It used to be a very simple, um, very, very cheap surgery that really wasn't a big deal. And it, and it just, you know, when you're trying to save a breed, it's in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's just not a big enough deal to, re to remove the dog over. And if you want a lesson in what happens whenever you, um, create a genetic, um, group of, of, of animals that don't have any genetic diversity. You only need to look at the Egyptians. You only need to look at, um, any, any Royal family that bred themselves into oblivion by not being willing to outcross. Um, there are also, uh, the Tasmanian devils. I watched a documentary on them recently where they had, um, a cancer, um, some type of weird contagious cancer that was just killing them all off. And the only thing that saved them was that there was a group of Tasmanian devils that was isolated on an island that did not have, or so there was something about them. I think they had a gene to fight it. There was something going on there where they were able to use the blood from those other ones. But basically because the, the, the Tasmanian devils in the area where they had the cancer were so inbred, um, that it was, it was basically just, it was, it was killing them off. So, um, so anyway, so there are far more dangerous things than cherry eye. And one of those is a lack of genetic diversity. So it's not in, you know, when, when you're, when you're in a position like I am, it is not worth it to remove a dog in my breed for something as trivial as cherry eye. Now, maybe in a breed with a lot more genetic diversity, maybe that is something that you would remove over, but in our particular breed, it's not. So, um, I hope that that is, um, in informational and helpful. And, um, I hope that whenever you go to your vet and they try to intimidate you and they try to warn you and they try to do all that stuff about the, about the cherry eye, you know, um, if you've listened to them and you tack it and then you have to go back in there and they're like, Oh, we'll just go ahead and remove it this time. And you feel played. Just know that I warned you. <laughs> so, um, just because they act like something is a big deal, doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Sometimes it is. It's worth it to do your research. It's worth it to ask around and figure out. But but as it stands um, right now, unfortunately, uh, most vets 
are just, they just don't have your dog in your best interest at heart right now. It's just, it's unfortunate. If you really look at the facts and you really look at what's going on and you really start to figure this stuff out, it, they really don't have your, your best interest at heart. Now, there are some vets that do. I do want to say that. There are some vets that do. Um, there, there are holistic vets out there. There are vets that would tell you exactly what I'm telling you about the heartworm. And they, those are the vets you want to find. Okay, those are the vets that, for example, vets that do um, antibody testing instead of just continually giving vaccinations and making sure that they're not giving the dog something it doesn't need, right? Like, um, there are vets out there that are doing the right thing, but they are very far and few, and you have to look for them, and you have to have higher expectations. And as we all become more informed, and as we all have higher expectations for our vets, they will have to rise to those expectations or be put out of business because we're all going to these other vets. So um, educate yourself and um, be a part of this movement to hold vets accountable and start to actually treat our dogs and us with respect and not like we're a bunch of you know wandering idiots. So I hope you guys are having a good night and I'll talk at you later. Bye.